gathered here today for a discussion on contemporary left politics. So as such, our meeting is titled The War of Position, uh, Charting a Way Forward. So I'll just uh, briefly tell you what um, the War of Position is. Uh, so the War of Position is basically an intellectual and cultural struggle. as 
people who are not interested in the world probably know more than me about certain things. But my position as somebody who has been consistently trying to study what what the world has been like shows us some interesting insights which might not be that obvious to a uh, lot of people. And one of the insights is that I don't know if you are noticing, but capitalism has become very resilient. I don't know how many of you are aware or are working in the area of platform capitalism, but platforms have become this newly emergent mode of capitalism in which in many different ways the worker does not think of themselves as the worker. By its very design, platforms keep workers away from each other. Gone are the days when you had to sit in a factory and sit in on a desk in your white collar job and you could talk to people. Now it is possible to organize vast organizations where not only does the worker does not think of themselves as the worker, the owner does not think of the worker as a worker. And everybody is very nicely indulging in a shared fantasy of association work. Sometimes I believe that in the famed Rosa Bernstein debate, reform or revolution, who was it that really won? I would like to hope it's Rosa, but I get reminded of Bernstein's insistence that capitalism is resilient, that new forms of cooperation are going to emerge. There is another thing that is very dear to me, which I work on. I am, before I turned to policy for the last few years, I was an AI scientist. I did my PhD in artificial intelligence. I worked for a few years as a research scientist working on AI systems the media company and the things you hear, you know, have creation of hegemony and all that. It's very interesting to look at it from the other side when you are in the act of creating hegemony. So, first thing is that remember in Grotary's Marx talks about, and if you don't know what these words mean, I'll explain. Marx talks about something called the organic composition of capital. Very basically talking about what we these days call automation. Marx is saying that the more automation arises, the harder it would be for capitalists to really find arbitrage. To you know, every capitalist make one like it's not going to be that one capitalist would have air, right? There is going to be this breakneck competition for little little bits of profit. And we are seeing that. So, so where now, comrades? We are looking at a possible future where the working class, by design, has been atomized. And not design in some malicious design of a bunch of capitalists sitting in a room and planning to do it. No, capitalists thought none of that. They just thought these technologies are good and they would help us structure work in a way that would help us make more profit. So happens that these technologies operate in a way that capitalism itself seems to be evolving right in front of our eyes. So at some point, I think as materialists, and I hope everybody in the room is a materialist, somebody who believes that reality is a thing and that reality can be engaged with fruitfully. As materialists, at some point, this becomes very obvious that we have entered an epoch of capitalism which requires us to look very carefully at all the three components of socialism. What are the three components of socialism? First, organization, political work, right? How we meet our organizations, does that make sense in the way capitalism is operating? For example, if workers do not even think of themselves and each other as workers in platforms, how do trade unions go And this is not something hypothetical or rhetorical, right? 
empirically speaking, the influence of trade unions in working class politics have been decreasing. And it's not just decreasing and you can, you know, go and give a, as platforms expand, the trade union as a centerpiece of proletarian politics cannot survive. And the platforms are not going to cease expanding. So you have to start thinking of new ways to engage with the proletarian class. Second, a lot of things, not because people seem to be doing some things, uh, thank you, whatever you were doing. So, politics. Again, reaching the point in capitalism where it is, and I'm going to speak a little bit about hegemony as well. What is a political will? Or what is the job of a politician who wants to see a better reality? Once upon a time, the answer was very clear that the job of a politician is to see state power. State was going to be the instrument of change. For the reformist, social democrat or the liberal, the state was going to be what you used to do welfare. For the socialist, anarchist and the communist, the state had to be defeated, but perhaps replaced by a different kind of state. And you know the anarchists keep insisting that they don't want a state, they just want a horizontal commune where everybody is elected in a democratic fashion and can be thrown out by a vote, which I call a state. So, and for the Marxist Leninists, it wants to be a state with a singular party, and the left communists said, no, we must not run it by a singular party, we should run it by a federation of Soviets. And this and that and everybody talking about the state all the time. You know who said the state is not really that important? First, it was the fascists. Fascists said, it's not the state which is important. It is culture. The culture is what is real. They insisted on it. There was a proto-fascist called a French syndicalist called Georges Sorel. And I, I don't speak French. My French is terrible, so probably butchering his name. But you should look up Sorel. Because Sorel is a very interesting chap. Sorel, do you know who was Sorel's ideal revolutionary? Lenin. Like Sorel looked at the Bolsheviks and he pointed out something very interesting. He said, yes, true, communism, nice, workers, but are the Bolsheviks really animated by proletarian consciousness? Or are they animated by a mythology? Is it a revolution or is it a coup? That's a question I believe you should ask. And fascists thought about it. Because to a lot of fascists, including Mussolini, the Bolsheviks were fascinating. In fact, there was an Italian fascist called Luzio Malaparte who went to study with the Bolsheviks, he went to the Soviet Union. And he wrote down a book called The Technique of Revolution, where he uh, studied from the Bolshevik and, and said, and used those techniques in the fascist revolution in Italy when Mussolini did his hundred uh, black shirt march or whatever. Right? They said the Bolsheviks are our inspiration. And the fascists kept insisting that material considerations, the one which animates Marxists, are only part of the game. There is another part of the game. What people actually believe. We did not agree with this. We invented something very complicated to counter it. It was called the base superstructure theory. Marx did not come up with it. Had Marx been alive, he would have cried at what we have done with his ideology, by the way. But we came up with it, you know. We had to somehow come up with a way to explain things we could not explain. So we came up with the superstructure. And we said that, oh, it's an epiphenomenon. You know, the base, it's what controls everything, the superstructure which emanates from the base. Not the really important thing. What is important is class consciousness and what is important is where you get your salary from. What is important is who controls the means of production. So even before being shot in her head and brutally murdered, Rosa Luxemburg kept hoping till the final day that the proletariat of Berlin 
we suddenly going to realize that fascism is bad. Okay. In fact, this is a very interesting joke among the Nazis. Have you heard of a beef steak Nazi? Now, you know, beef is nowadays frowned upon in India. But have you heard the phrase beef steak Nazi? When you cook beef, it is suggested that you don't cook it completely. Keep the inside raw, it's tastier to eat. How do I know I don't know? Somebody told me. But the Nazis had a joke that a lot of Nazis are brown from the outside, red from the inside. You know, there is a joke among the stormtroopers, the Stumbike crew, the left wing of the Nazi party, which were later killed in the uh, Operation Hummingbird or Night of the Long Knives. But they said, you know, in our stormtrooper battalion, there are 50% social democrats, 49% communists. There is that one Nazi guy who will get rid of him as well. The Nazis believe that their ranks are filled with the communists, basically, or rather the working class. They were too well. People have measured. At no point did the uh, percentage of the middle class cease dominating the Nazi party over the working class, but it has significant working class component. So what's going on? And should we be really happy about what is going on in South Africa? What does it mean for getting, like what does getting state power mean? Let's talk a bit about hegemony. What is hegemony? Comrade has explained it quite well. It's when a communist party creates communist culture. But what does that even mean? Where does this word come from? So, let's talk a little bit about Italians. There was a party in Italy called the Italian Socialist Party, PS something, I, again I don't speak Italian, I'm, I'm going to translate, transliterate, butcher, or I'm going to do all that, Comrade Mussolini, Comrade Gramsci, please forgive me, both of you. <laughs> and then yes, Comrade Mussolini, Comrade Mussolini was the leader of the left wing of the socials. People used to call him Italian Lenin. Imagine, in a different timeline, you would have to tolerate that guy as one of your statues as well. Then, so. <laughs> and have you seen his speeches? It's very bombastic. Like, his hand starts to rotate like this and the other hand goes here. But Comrade Mussolini one day realized that socialism sucks. But a simple thing. He was angry at the socialists for not being revolution. He was like, hey, you reformists, hey, you are waiting around to seize power, liberals. If there is one thing I hate more than a conservative, it's liberals. Comrade Mussolini. Comrade Mussolini hated liberals and hated bourgeois democracy. Bourgeois democracy, yeah, All what out by the media. Comrade Mussolini one day also started to find other interesting ideas. He came to the idea that, you know, if the working class is to be dominant, very different from Marx and his class analysis, if the working class is to be dominant, why can't we do a little bit of imperialism? Our working class should be the best working class. Our working class should be armed and we should go and destroy that Ethiopian and Libyan and whatever nonsense. So, next time you get the urge, whenever somebody says National Socialism, ha ha ha, you guys were also, and you are like, National Socialism is a right wing conspiracy, they use the need to be It's not true. I hope you guys know this, right? The fascists were inspired from the proletarian movements in Spain and France. The National Socialists initially, before, and I will talk about them as well at some point, perhaps later, but there were 
trapped the national socialists, Nazis, some of whom were talking about working class party, but a very different kind of working class party. Just like we sing the international, they also made a song, the national, working class but national, BMS. So what does it mean when a communist party means? Are we really fighting, are we really fighting to take over the state as a class? Or are we fighting to dissolve a certain mode of production? There is a distinction between them. And interestingly, when you take over the state, you may take it over in various different ways. We have been in fighting about this for ages. One party, multiple parties, vanguard party, mass party, this party, that party. Let's look at what happens when we do protest? South America is a fantastic example. There was a time in the past when Latin American countries, many of them had center left, if not left, left governments, right? And it's happening again. We have seen so many left governments in South America, in Bolivia, Chile, Peru, Mexico, Honduras, hopefully soon in Brazil. But Bolivian minister tells us that he is deeply apologetic about what's happening with the natives. But you know, in order to run an actual socialist state, you need the lithium. And the Chilean president, who by the way correctly calls out the Venezuelan and the Bolivian for being authoritarian as well. We are not authoritarians. We are libertarian leftists. The Chilean guy who is very libertarian and very anti-authority stops some of the migrants from Venezuela, which he hates, to enter into his beloved Chile. Because while we deeply love internationalism and uh, while, you know, workers of all land unite, it takes money to take care of refugees. We are a poor small country. Please, after me. So, revealed. All these libertarians are suspicious, right? Let's go to the other side. The Marxist Lenin's guy. Who, by the way, is not a Marxist Lenin's, but a Trotsky. Do you know that? Maduro is a Trot. But anyway, he, every two, three years he says like one line, all name Trotsky, and then he forgets about that. But uh, who cares, right? He's the real one, right? Because the, 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 the polished one is liked by the America, so this one must be good. He crushes trade unions which don't like No trade unions you can be, are the one which he likes. Otherwise, off to the... Cuba, surely, that is the good one, right? Doctors all over the world, medical internationals. Driving a journalist. You know the, I don't know, the son or the grandson of Che Guevara, who is like some, I don't believe in rules, I am practically guy, tried to become like this, I don't know, father, grandfather. He ran away to America. Am I saying? that imperfect socialisms are bad. Now somebody is going to wave around Michael Parenti and you are, you are an orthodox communist, you just want, you just want us to be perfect. We are trying to create our movements, we are trying to create our states. That's the problem. We are trying to create our states. Capitalist states operate in a certain manner. Even if that capitalist state is run by the workers. Even if that capitalist state is run by a group of people who claim to be representing the working class, which is generally what happens. You know, we never had a capitalist state or the Yugoslavia, where the workers ran the factories, but still there was a government. Capitalist state behave in a particular way. 
the political economy of the world forces capitalist states to work in a particular manner. There is no such thing as a socialist state. Stalin was unfortunately wrong. You can't have your socialist state. That's not a thing. You will make a state with a socialist party perhaps or many socialist parties also need. But you will still need to trade. We once tried not trading. That ruined my state. It was not even done by a socialist. It was genius of Jawaharlal Nehru. We will stop exporting and we will equalize trade. It was one of the most terrible policies we have had in Bengal. It ruined the proletariat in Bengal. You can't not trade. In fact, Karl Marx got once so irritated by this argument that he said, rather than you lot, I, I would support free trade. I would support the most freest of trade which the capitalists support rather than this kind of nonsense that we can create socialism in a separate little land. It can't be done. So if you can't have a socialist state, and we can go into the debate on why I insist on that. And any state you need, whether with a mass strike, a revolution, parliamentary reform, or whatever, they are going to be more or less light. At best, they are going to be like the Latin American states today. And the Latin American states are doing wonderful things, by the way. Aside from building socialism. That they can't do. Not that they are unwilling to do, but it is hard to do. It's hard for a super part to do it. A super part tried, it failed. It does not exist anymore. There is another super part which just rather energetically embraced capitalism than distinguished. Smaller countries do not have a chance. A socialist state is an oxymoron, it can't exist. So what is to do? Give up. Wait for the stars to align for the working class over all over the world to realize that uh, the day has come, the death knell of capitalism and everything. That is utopianism of a degree which is which we should not contact. So what do we do? And you know, the person who asked this question again and again from himself, sitting in a jail cell, was Gramsci. Remember Comrade Mussolini? Comrade Mussolini makes his own movement. United fascists of Italy or something. I have forgotten the whole name of the fascist movement. And the manifesto of the fascist movement was all part of the proletariat, working us from 40 to something, retire early, let women vote, universal education, etc. Very progress. I would say the original fascist manifesto was to the left of any Indian Communist Party. But then, Comrade Mussolini also realized that uh, all this is nonsense. And while we should have a, what he called a corporatist state, whether this phrase is also misused a lot, fascism is corporatism. Everybody, when you think, oh, you mean fascism is ruled by the corporates? No, that's not what Mussolini meant. Corporatism means that classes are a part of a corporate whole. Stop your class struggle and have a strong state tell the capitalists and the proletariat how to behave with each other. If that is the definition of corporatism, where a strong state in the interest of the nation tells the capitalists how to behave with the proletariat, how many start thinking? But you know, Mussolini was like, fine, all that is fine, the first thing is we come to power, then we do all this revolutionary stuff. Comes to power, the basic way you come to power in a state, Gundagati. Then there is a debate with the partner. It's a very wonderful debate. Comrade Mussolini and Comrade Gramsci yelling at each other. Comrade Gramsci says, Mussolini, your cadre are building up my cadre. Mussolini says, So, in Russia, your cadre is building up all the other cadres. She is like, That is not a good comparison. You are breaking the law. Until you are communist, you are breaking the law. What would you guys have done? And then uh, Gramsci says, look, our violence 
is revolutionary violence. Your violence is reactionary violence. There's a difference. Muslims said, okay, good argument, now you go to jail. So, 1926, I believe, Gramsci sent it to jail. And after a bit of the Bolshevism goes away from his head, he starts to actually think like the academic he is. It's a very good one. Okay, this was not supposed to happen. Leave aside political victories and defeats, this was not supposed to happen. Because wasn't capitalism supposed to go into a series of unrecoverable crises? Wasn't the working class supposed to wake up one day and self-realize its class status? Wasn't the leaders of the working class powerful enough to seize power? In fact, the party was not even supposed to do much. It was the working class all the way through which was going to do all this. What happened? Then, Mussolini starts to engage with critics of Marx. There are two critics he engages with. Croce, Italian banker, to butcher his name, C-R-O-C, I don't know his name is Croce, and Sorel, the French guy. And Mussolini, then, wait, 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 wait. These guys, are misrepresenting Marx. Because both Croce and Sorel are saying Marx does not care about culture. Marx is saying that class is all that matters. Marx is a class reductionist. And, and, and Gramsci, sorry, keep confusing their timing. Gramsci says that Marx actually never said this. People interpreted Marx like this. Like everybody from Second International onwards, Kotsky, Rosa, Lenin, all of them interpreted Marx in a very particular way which Marx had actually openly repudiated in his own time and Engels had repudiated because Engels had this whole conversation about uh, communes in Russia, communes are these village uh, farm societies where the whole village runs the thing and somebody had asked could this mean that Russia could skip over you know, more brutal forms of capitalism and try building local democracy, etc. So a lot of Russian Marxists were like, no, 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 no. We need a capitalist revolution. Of course, it will be done by the working class, but we need a state capitalism. Plakhanov had said that, and later Lenin would say it. Um, but Engels had contradicted that. Engels wrote that at no point in our analysis were we making recommendations for all material conditions. We were not saying that every country, every people, every economy has to go through this nonsense to build a better world. We observed what happened in Western Europe and we analyzed it and we wrote about it. But economy is not deterministic. Class change is not deterministic. Modes of production and history are not deterministic things. And Engels and Marx kept saying this throughout their lives. In fact, Marx was often really surprised that people are asking this question. Because Marx was like, isn't this common sense in a way? But it wasn't because whatever Marx had said became word of word. You stopped doing analysis and you started doing exegesis. Exegesis is when you take a holy book and you start to find quotations from it to verify your already made up mind. So, Gramsci speaks that people like Sorel, Croce, who were saying that Marx is a class reductionist are wrong. Marx was not a class reductionist. Marxists, however, are class reductionists. And because we don't read Marx, right? We read Marx readers. We read people who read Marx, but we don't read Marx. So we don't realize that. And it's not that what Marx said, Marx could be wrong. He could be completely wrong. But at least engage with the guy. Try to try to actually engage with the logic. It could be that he is wrong. He never told you to. Un Marx said, "What did he say? Revolutionary cri criticize everything, something like that." But what we have become a radical apologist. Apologia for Marx. Apologia for Engels. Apologia for Lenin. Apologia for every every dead leader who has been dead for a century. We can't seem to accept that they could be wrong about something. So. Gramsci has a lot of time. You know, when you are locked up in jail by a fascist, you have lots of free time. Gramsci started to think. And he's like, okay. So if Marx did not see that the economy is the fundamental 
logic from which superstructure emanates, then what is the superstructure? Gramsci came to a very radical answer, which is not at all radical, it's actually common sense. He came to the conclusion that non-material thing matters to people. Culture matters to people. Myths matter to people. Religion matters to people. It could be that those things are, according to you, nonsense things. It could be that you think that economy is the most important thing because it is the only thing which controls how wealth is distributed, which is the source of all power. But once that influences culture, once dominant culture is created, it becomes its own beast. And here, Gramsci in his prison notebooks is at his finest. He talks about war of position versus war of men which is what the unimaginative name of today's talk is. Gramsci says, there are two kinds of war. All wars, political, economic, real war, there are two kinds of war. One is that you are both standing in front of each other, or in politics, you know, debating your political opponent. Like, okay, sir, you are not a democrat, I am a democrat. You don't support the constitution, I support the constitution. Your free market is not really free. All of these are lines which the left is really like. Free market is not really free. We support the constitution, you don't. You are anti-A, we are anti-O. The war of position is when you start to ask questions like, why are we arguing on the market? Is the market uh, something that was brought from heaven? Is it, a, is it an organic fact of the world which was always there? See debates on religion and culture, but one could easily ask the question, all this culture and religion people are fighting on, did it exist before 300 years? Gramsci started to realize something very interesting. Gramsci realized that a lot of political battles operate within the realm of certain accepted common sense constraints. And those common sense constraints, the ones who get to set them, they almost win. It sounds very commonsensical when I say it that way, and to us this should be commonsensical, but it was not commonsensical when it was thought of the first time. So if the war of position is a theme, then Gramsci realizes something even more interesting, what he calls the silent revolution. Gramsci is like, everybody loves the French. Talk of the French Revolution, heads being chopped off, Robespierre. Why don't we talk of the English Revolution? British had a much better capitalism than the French did. French were really running around chopping each other's head, the British were doing trade in India and in America. So the British were more revolutionary than the French compared to aristocratic Europe. Britain was progressive. Britain freed the slaves much before everybody else did. They, they had these parliamentary Britain was revolutionary. You don't talk about it. It's always the French. French were revolutionary, not the British. Why? Because Gramsci says we all have conflated the process with the outcome. All this hard, hard. The act of the revolution, the seizing of the state power. British had a much better revolution and a much more solid one. Never saw it happen. One day the aristocrats were ruling Britain, the other day the capitalists were ruling Britain. How did it happen? And it was a much more permanent revolution. It was a much more thorough revolution. It was a much more liberal revolution. If liberalism at a high point, it was Great Britain. But nobody realized this. Everybody with France, Napoleon, horses, charging across battlefields. <coughs> we really like the, that sort of stuff. It's very dramatic. It gets the blood rolling. But the Brits were completely correct when they called their revolution the glorious revolution. Not one drop of blood. One day, the monarchy just decided to give the parliament all of its power. Parliament said, thank you sir, you can be your monarch. 
you can come wave on the balcony two times a week you know people will love you but we are a democracy no thanks and gramsci realizes that what has happened in italy is a silent revolution that mussolini and his band of merry men wearing fancy black uniforms no that was not the revolution the revolution was already won by the fascists before all that happened that was just a theater they came the king said oh come on you take power if you win the war of position you will actually win is there an organization that is a good modern example of what i call a gramscian party so no, there are the traditional political party which tries to seize the state and then you have the gramscian party which rather does this there is an organization i am not going to take its name but it was known very well they were formed in 1925 when they were formed they made a promise to themselves which they did not break up at least 25 years 27 years rather they promised themselves they will not try to take state power they will not take party elections they will not try to take power by force they will not arm the garden they will only focus on praja they will only focus on education they will only focus on training i don't believe till 1952 they, they broke their word in 1952 they made their first political organization but from 1925 to 1952 they operated purely for the war of position compare them with us there is a scholar javed alam who coincidentally was a professor at jnu i don't know that not very good he wrote a very nice paper on the indian communist movement which you should by the way you should read if you are interested in these things i am going to do the thing and i am the winner of the reading circle for some reading circle feel free to join it it is open to everybody aside from fascists but as we have established today everybody can be a fascist so uh, feel free to join our reading circle But there is a paper javed alam's paper which you should by the way our reading circle for this month and the next one is going to be doing indian communist history we are we are going to thoroughly uh, examine indian communists from 1910 yes we are going to be talking about savarkar and his roommate virendranath chattopadhyay yes we will be irritating with the fact that the founder of two separate dharas of indian politics were flat mates and brats who were friends we are going to be discussing their bratty little privileged childhood in twitter among other things but that organization it's the perfect gramscian organization on the planet compare them with our victims like this pink tied in recently the organization of american states which is an imperialist you know american shoshar thing all that america and its vassals all sit together and decide over the fate of america and of course venezuela not allowed cuba not allowed to enter so this time it was like some of the left wing states were we will boycott maduro boycotted it the other states boycotted it two left government states went Pedro Castillo went and Boric went. Peru and Chile. How do you understand this? Some people, of course, said that Boric, not a Marxist-Leninist, this shows that libertarian communism is liberalism. Actually, it is fascism. Actually, it is worse than fascism. While forgetting that before the election, Pedro Castillo was also a Marxist-Leninist. and immediately as soon as the elections ended and he won he promised everybody i am not going to touch the market please vote for me cia please i am not going to touch the market nobody is touching the market market is not being touched please guys no please thank you no market being touched by the way mr libertarian communist boris also said the same thing market market is not going to be touched everything else will be touched we are very progressive representation autonomy 
free things, not touching the market. And if you feel that a bit of revisionism is good, uh, Xi Jinping, leader of the free world, also market not to be touched. Anything else will be touched, market is not to be touched. You can take your flavor, Leninist, anti Leninist, Stalinist, Trotskyist, Techist, Maoist. If you are going to rule a state, if you are going to be a president tomorrow, you will do the same thing. And if you are not doing the same thing, you are not your student. You should do the same thing. Because the market will collapse otherwise and you will find yourself good or worse starving. But you can try something else. You could, on a small number, stop reacting to capitalism and start to study it. Then to try to make a case against you, present it to the audience. Let's be very honest to ourselves. Just the fact I gave this whole speech in English means that anybody who is engaging with it probably not proletariat in the sense you understand. Either they are extremely well paid for the delivery of students or they are the petty for the We have to stop using these words as slurs at each other. Hey, you petty for the Nonsense. We are all, all the same class. We are not doing physical manual work. At best, we are highly paid intellectual workers. So we have the privilege and the power to make a case against capitalism if such a case is possible. But instead of trying to save the working class by forming a vanguard party, one could try to place this case, very well argued case in front of it and try to see what it wants. When everybody, everybody in the working class thought that the working class is going to be victorious, it was sensible. In fact, it was logical to do what people in the Second International and the Comintern did. It was the logical step to try to snatch state power, either through elections or through revolutions or whatever. But they were wrong. Their analysis was empirically wrong. Imperialism, last stage of capitalism, incorrect. And till you start to engage with the world as it exists. You know, Lukacs, that uh, central European guy, I keep butchering his name as well, he wrote, I think 20 years after Lenin, that anybody who is reading Lenin now is obsolete, like, you know, we are wasting our time, it's obsolete. The theory of imperialism doesn't work. It's been what? Hundred years? Still, Lenin is the last stage of capitalism. When is the last stage going to come? When are we going to see uh, the sort of, you know, firm division between global core and periphery as predicted by uh, Samir Amin and the world systems people? Because, you know, here in the periphery there is a country called China. And below that, in the further periphery, there is a country called Vietnam. They have completely embraced the idea. Now they are making, going to make their own colonies. How the world works, and you know you can disagree with me on that, and I welcome that, but nobody does. The problem is that we have stopped trying to analyze. We have become a movement of organizers. Everybody wants to be an organizer. Everybody wants to. Come work, karo comrade. But you know, you know what you are working for. What is the point of the organization? If the answer is we want to snatch state power, then when you are doing a bad job. But if the answer is something else, then we need to start thinking what the answer is. My answer to this question, what is to be done, is very simple. That as a movement, we need to place the priors of the movement in front of the working class and see what they think of it. Because right now, how many of you listened to my last talk on Pashi? Quick quiz question. If you know that, if you have heard the answer from you, you will not raise your hand. Right? 
which trade union in India has the most number of the industrial working class, the, the traditional product? Yes. No? Yes. Huh? Congress. So the vanguard theory is correct, who join Congress? Most number of the most advanced part of the working class is the vanguard group. They all, their allegiance is with the Congress. Even in this time, like I want to go and ask them that, why sir, please join BMS, it is better for So the question arises that how much alienated or non-existent is the organic intellectual from the world. Gramsci kept, you know, Gramsci was a very optimistic person. He has that line which we all keep misusing, optimism of the will. That is not a, like optimism of the will is not something you are supposed to say, you are supposed to act on, right? Like it's not something we say to feel good about our really bad, you know, optimism of the will, something like that. Optimism of the will, it, it involves active optimism, it, it means you to actually analyze things. And, okay, so, so, so where do we stand? We stand at the reality all over the world. Where, I don't know, do you guys follow European politics? I was second time, I don't want to speak one minute more than one hour. When did I start? Six five. Six five. Right, we'll speak till 7 10 and then we'll have a conversation. So, in European politics, Germany recently had its elections. Germany was, you know, German public is a very like Kerala. Here, then there, then here, then there. Very easy to predict. So, after so much of Angela Merkel, they are now left it. Right? But the entire left vote went to the Social Democratic Party of Deutschland. It did not go to Dying, which is the left. The Congress. Germany has a very mature working class. If you have complaints about the Indian working class, you can't have complaints about the German working class. They are the very definition of the vanguard. They are all educated. They are all organized into gigantic trade unions. They all play, pay their union dues. Those unions are left. These are politically educated working class who are politically sharp, who are who are at the very forefront of the proletariat, they are doing high technology jobs, they are not lump and whatever, they are, they all voted for the SDG and not, not the communists because they are not idiots, because they understand the game much better than we do. They understand that capitalism is here to stay, let us try to get the best benefits we can. You will not be able to do anything without the world. That is something I think everybody in the room agrees. For this place, first of all, you are fighting a losing a rear guard action against a cultural assault, and the and the people doing that cultural assault have been practicing since 1925. Well, for us, culturalism was a bad word. You know, communists used to use culturalism as a slur against other communists who would talk of things like gender or caste. Culture. That was just like you petty bourgeois, you decadent, you revisionist, etc. etc. So liberal was the person. So this brings us to you know, am I trying to make you sad? Have I just given a gigantic speech to indirectly say that Latin America doesn't matter? Their victories are just capitalist negotiations. No, I am not trying to make you sad, but their victories are capitalist renegotiations. But they are doing the best. And you should still do that. Capitalist negotiations are an important part of proletarian politics. Electoralism is good. Don't fall for people who say that electoralism is a waste of time. No, you have to do that. But it can't be the forefront of your politics. Even organization can't be the forefront of your politics. Because organizational work, at the end of the day, how many people can you organize? How much? 
you know the size of that they are working class. You can't you won't be able to ever organize that. The primary battle remains the battle for the common sense. If the working class thinks that it is common sensical for them to organize, self-organize, they will and they have done in the past. You don't know how many of you are, remember, some of you might be too young. Remember Manesar Gold now? There was a strike there. Maruti factories. The workers there were not your college educated radicals. They were and they were not also like the other side of the spectrum. They were not like Masons or anything. They were the traditional industrial working class as you understand them. And they realized that it was in their common sense to organize and strike and they did, they did not wait for a party. In fact, the parties were very much against it and lot of bad things happened. Do you remember the Bombay textile pills? There was a small party called the Lal Nishan party, if you have ever heard of that. Once the communist movement had been destroyed in Bombay, CPI basically negotiated with the state. A small party called the Lal Nishan party formed. But what is also important to remember from the Bombay lesson is that despite the very successful wildcat strike, what did the capitalists do? Stop engaging. They stopped oppressing. This is left. Close the factories and left. Because ultimately, political economy is going to trump every single day, right? Right now, in the political economy, if you are not looking at automation, if you are not looking at platforms, you are not looking at reality. To give an example, I, class I belong, I live in one of those concrete ghettos, those long buildings, you know, which have small pigeon poops at the top where you live. Nobody in that world thinks of themselves as a worker. The engineer paying 15,000 rent for a 2 BHP does not think of himself as a worker. He's running the world, why should he think of himself as a worker? The domestic help he gets also does not think of herself as a worker. And I gendered this deliberately. You know, in fact, I had a friend who went around organizing domestic workers and one very common thing that we used to come up is that we are not Muslim. 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 Right? If a domestic worker does not think of herself as a worker, then you come down. You have the Chaukidhar. Chaukidhar also does not think of herself as a worker. If a Chaukidhar gets to keep the poor people out, nobody in that entire modern system thinks of themselves as a worker. Everybody is a worker. Common sense. If they thought of themselves as workers, perhaps they would think about other things like union, wages, minimum wage, whatever. But till you get a person to think of themselves as a worker, how can you expect solidarity? It's one of the hardest things to do. I come from technology. It's one of the hardest things to do is to get a technology worker to think of themselves as a worker. But once they do, things happen very fast. I don't know. Any of you know what Project Maven was? Project Maven was a CIA project which was to uh, a very like close level surveillance and weaponry, all automated through drones, finding targets, killing targets, etc. The entire project went to Google. At that time, Google was going through some very interesting changes. There was an organization called Tech Workers Coalition, which was unionizing among Silicon Valley engineers. And half of the Google engineers walked out instead of working on Project Mail. It became so unpopular that Google had to let go of that project. Google, a company which has more of a budget than several small countries, was forced to halt because the workers who were striking were ridiculously expensive workers to replace. So if you can get the expensive workers to think of themselves as workers, common sense will start to change really fast. I am a professor at IIT Bombay who talk to me about this. See, I have a very simple theory at this point. It sounds, it 
it's a joke, but it's like you know, anything is a. It's I say it in desperation and resignation, not in the way they say it. But if anything is going to happen, the engineers are going to do it. The engineers agree. Enthusiastically, but probably in a different sense than I'm using the word. But if anything is going to happen, the engineers are going to do it. No, all of you, all your organizational work, keep doing it. All your parcha work, you keep doing it. Find an engineer friend in each other. Find an engineer friend. Just catch them. Like, sir, ma'am, please. Sit. One minute. Chai. Do it. Fight the war of position. Fight what is common sense. Common sense tells you that humanities are progressives and the engineers are reactionaries. Common sense tells you that the academic and the proletariat have nothing in common. Common sense tells you that victory is impossible. Common sense also tells you that reading is a thing elite people do and the actual work. Marx and Engels themselves said a lot angrily when this kind of sentiment used to come around. Because you know, this kind of sentiment has a double trap. The first trap is you start to think of yourself as a part of the project. I am an academic, I am not a project. The second trap is you think the proletariat is too dumb to understand theory. So you are already setting yourself separate. There is an ascent there, and you have already relegated themselves to foot soldier. Reading is important. Now, I came to this conclusion three years back, like an RC protest. I saw too much. And I became very disenchanted. I saw leaders of the movement capitulating to ethno-nationalism, to fascism as it existed in Assam, and sort of taking very populist lines. But I also realized that it's impossible to take a mass movement and get anything useful out of it because the mass does not think of itself as a class. And uh, at the end of the day, people are not there protesting because of a larger political view. They are protesting because they are. I realized that my job is to educate. I will go around teaching people. Then I thought, okay, educating might need its own organization. See, that's the interesting thing, right? We have been thinking of organizing so long, since 1923, that the party, the parties were formed. Has anybody thought how is radical education to be done? And Paul Freer thought of it, but have you thought about it? Everybody knows this is a vanguard party, this is how you organize it. This is a mass or this is how you organize it. How, how do you create a mass or not to agitate people or to get them in protest, but to educate, educate thousands of people? How, 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 what kind of an organization does that? I've been thinking about that for three years. It's not an easy answer. Right now in Koshampi, my organization, which only has a thousand people, it's so hard. And these are thousand, yes. I did an analysis. There was like five percent of like actual working class or something, but most of them are like the professional managerial class. That you know, they were aristocracy, whatever you want to call it. And even then, with their free time and privilege, they are sad with their lives. They have no energy after that. They don't want to read. Educating is not easy, or trivial, but it is useful and necessary because still you discuss these things. Nobody is good. Where will the next Marx come from? D.D. Koshambi, after whom my circle is named, he never joined a party. One of the reasons he gave was that he was, at that time, independence. He was disillusioned with the lack of ideological progress of the party. He said that the parties are basically copy-pasting what already exists. There is no thinking happening. And while this may sound extremely uncharitable, we know it's true. Had it not been true, the sheer number of cadres the parties had would have translated to some kind of social acceptability of communism, right? I'm not talking of state power. Many people don't have state power. I'm not talking about that. I don't care about state power. But you ask a common person what they think of communism. For you, socialism, fine, the same meaning, but people think they are two different things. 
people don't like the words. They don't even know what the words are, but they don't like them. The ones who know what the words are also don't like them, but that's the thing. <laughs> so, they are charting the way forward. What is to do? A acknowledge that technology is changing fast. Technology is not something isolated, it's part of the world. Because that is changing fast, capitalism is changing fast. If you don't know what the raise your hand. Have you read the book Surveillance Capitalism? No. Why? It's a terrible book, but you should have read it. Soshana Zubov's argument is wrong, but it's a worthwhile argument to engage with. It's important because it talks, it goes into the heart of macro of what is going on. And then Evgeny Morozov, another person, critics that, critics it well. Soshana Zubov claims that a new form of capitalism has arisen. Evgeny Morozov basically says that no, it's not true. Both of them are talking about the tech monopolies which are running everything you do. If you think of yourself, not even saying you have to be a communist or a socialist, if you think of yourself as a person who wants a better tomorrow, you need to understand what these companies are doing. You need to understand how they operate. You need to understand how that economy works and how it influences every human company of the world. Once you have understood that, you need to tell others that. You know, once there was this, uh, really, I don't know which scientist said it, but it was something like, you know, once you realize that you want to run into the street, hold somebody by the shoulders and shake them and say, do you understand this? Do you understand this? I am like that with AI. Once you understand what this whole Tam Jham is working like, you want to run around telling people as if you have figured out something very important. It's important to be What is to be done? Education is to be done. The way forward, we need to become ideologues again. Rosa Luxemburg had said that the movement of the working class cannot progress without the thunder and lightning of debate. Here, debate, not calling each other names, not calling each other liberals or reformists or divisionists or all that nonsense, but talking on understanding of the world, creating a shared understanding of the world. And it's not necessary that that shared understanding of the world will come from the past. When Marx arrived into the picture, Marx critiqued and to a large extent disagreed with the most radical progressive analysts before him. Marx made his name critiquing Proudhon and Proudhon was the Marx of his time. Proudhon was the you know, the godfather of the anarchists of that time. By the way, Marx was not completely right. There are certain parts of Proudhon he gets wrong. We will get into that in the future. And suddenly I may go, oh, Marx, no, no, no. But the point is, that is important. Nobody told Marx, ground by Jaya Nagar or Bombay. Because what Marx was doing was also important. And Marx never thought that he is different. Marx, the one of the most important and short, short being the key word here, works of Marx, wage, labor and capital. It was a speech to a bunch of factory workers in Brussels. And we use that as a textbook today. I use that as a textbook, I don't know what it is. So, educating is important. And trying to develop the ideology, the analysis further. In fact, trying to go beyond the ideology. Trying to Find out reality is important, I believe. <laughs> Marx never thought of what he was doing as ideological work. Marx was against ideology. Marx thought of ideology as something which clouds reality. And what he was doing was critique, which is different from ideology. Basically, according to Marx, the political economy of his time was the ideology. And what he was doing was trying to penetrate. It's about time we do that again. I am not saying that I am going to, at the end of my talk, take a hat from somewhere, put out a rabbit from it and say, this is what the Indian left needs to do. 
but I am deeply convinced that this is what led me on the engage with ideas and agile. Organizations we have always been good at agile. We good organizers. We have been impressive organizers. An entire movement born from the anti-colonial movement gives you that advantage. We always thought of ourselves as you know challenging the state, the British, etc., etc. That we have. Even in today, even in the back foot we are today, we have that threat. What we are not good are good ideas, good analysis. When in the 60s and the 70s, the whole movement in Europe, Guy Debord and all of these people, I think at that point, it's it's sad that we did not continue thinking on those lines or we stopped thinking essentially we started going back into action that is the answer to the crisis which faces us today the italian guy bodiga i don't like him i don't like his answers i don't like his analysis of the party i don't like how he thinks of the movement he believed that for example um, there should only be one party that democracy is bad and it's because socialism is rational, all analysis would logically come to a coherent, you know, logically it will all collate without any democratic voting, without any disagreement. I think that is nonsense. But at least Vodiga went beyond where he came from and he tried to radically reimagine the movement. That is all I have for today. Thank you. So we please close the camera so that.